All right, I'm going to talk about the cliff in one second, but I need to just like say thank you to Diana. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing your doubt. Um, that voice, am I a vulture? Am I a vulture? Am I a vulture? Um, that, I would just share really quickly, that, that voice led me away from journalism for a couple years. I, I had been working on uh, a show called Radio Lab, which is a ball. You should check it out. Um, it's, a, it's a radio show, a science documentary series that, that also looks at stories that are often incredibly emotional um, and then bumps them up against science. And I was kind of growing up as a reporter. I had had no journalistic training. I sort of fell in love with radio in this odd way, um, but just as a listener um, and, and sort of got in the, the back door by burning lots of CDs. Um, and... And, and as I grew up as a reporter there, I could tell there was this hunger on the editorial staff for emotional stories, for tears, for emotion. And this weird thing would happen where you show up in a room with a microphone and it transforms space and people would tell me their stories and their tears would come. And I remember one day I was in Michigan, rural Michigan, interviewing a family about whether the loss of their brother and son, he had died fighting a forest fire, he, um, which ended up saving the life of an endangered warbler, a bird. And for decades, humans had preve been preventing fire because you know humans don't like fire. Um, and that, that they had been blaming cowbirds for the parasitic parasitization of, of this rare bird warbler's nest when all along it had been the humans preventing the fire. And what this bird needed was for the forest to burn and regenerate. It needed to nest in young trees. And anyway, this guy had gone into the forest service because he loved birds. Um, and a controlled burn was set and he went out to fight it and he died fighting it. And then slowly, slowly, you could see it on a graph, this bird, which was almost down to zero, uh, zero individuals came back by the hundreds. And, and so we were doing a story about environmental sort of human judgments of the environment, how we often get things wrong and pick the wrong villain, the evil cowbird. And obviously his story gave it stakes. Um, and I remember I was in this, this house during a storm asking his brother, his sister, his mother, if, if, his, if his life had been in vain, you know, how they, was this man's life worth saving a bird? An intellectual idea, but that gives it, gives it emotion. Um, and the siblings were, you know, they said, yeah, maybe the, the, the brother made a kind of sweet, sweet call that, you know, without him, the, the, the woods might be going silent, all he'd ever cared about this bird. And we chatted and chatted, and suddenly the power went out. There was a storm and it just went out and it just got really silent. And the mother, about 75, maybe 80, who had just been silent the whole time, looked up at me with these huge eyes. For some reason, they reminded me of a turtle. And I think it's because turtles are often so quiet and when they finally look up, there's like this intensity. She just said, talking about this isn't gonna bring him back. What are you doing here? And I didn't know, I didn't have an answer. And that, am I a vulture, am I a vulture? I, I felt nervous going to talk to them. I didn't really want to, but I, I, I wanted to get the story. I wanted to make the editors happy, but I didn't have the answer in my heart. I didn't feel comfortable. And I, I remember driving home from Michigan to New York. It's like a 15 hour drive. And, and the radio was talking about the tornado and a life had already been lost. And I was thinking about death and that mother's eyes and my mother's eyes and judgment on myself. And I just thought, I, am I a vulture? Yes, I am not meant for this job. I can't, I can't do this. And I, and I left. I left shortly after that. And I um, went to study fiction, safer zone. You're not, you're not really messing with anyone's life. And I, and I tried to write fiction stories for a few years. And I, that had always secretly been the moment that I left, am I a vulture? And then a couple years later, I, I finally shared that story with um, Jad Abumrad, the host of Radiolab, who's just been a huge mentor 
And I said, I don't know if I can come back. I don't know if I can do that. And he said, Lulu, that voice and that question is what makes you exactly the person to do that because you're, you're thinking about it. Now, I don't know if that's true, but now when I hear it, I think, thank goodness it's here. And, and I think we make mistakes, we go too far, but we can correct and we can be haunted by our mistakes. Um, okay, so Cliff, I'm gonna do this quickly. So, okay, all right, so here we go. Okay, all right, so yeah, so, so just, the edge of what is allowed in re reporting um, or in a newsroom or in a sort of highly journalistic um, context. What's allowed? Can you sing on the radio? Can you, can you uh, rhyme? Can you, can you play? Can you, add, can you bring games into your interview situations? Can you go too dark? Can you go too irreverent? Can you swear? I am interested in this space of kind of pushing the boundary or walking right up to the edge of what's allowed. And I don't know why, I think perhaps I'm like part of a horrible ADD generation that, um, that for me as a listener and a reader, if, if I'm not being kind of like pulled and pushed in some way, things will just go over my head or I'll get, I'll get too easily lulled. Um, and so I'm constantly thinking about how can I catch the attention of someone who doesn't give a damn about public radio? Um, how can I lure them into a story? Um, and, and Pauline said, you know, we're, we're here to talk about how to amplify your story, but we don't want to, we, we want to bring an emotion. We don't want to manipulate. I would like to manipulate. Um, I, I, I don't know. I am thinking all the time about how can I make a listener feel? I want them to feel. And my only, the only way I kind of console myself is that I'm trying to do it for good. I'm trying to use the standard techniques of ma manipulation, suspense, just kind of low brow tricks um, to pull in people to listen to things they might not normally listen to. Questions like, where do people with disability fit in society? Not a story that's sort of an exhibitionist, voyeuristic, inspiration porn story about somebody who's different and look, they can make it anyway, but stories that really take on questions about how can we ourselves approach this question differently? Disability, severe mental illness isn't going away. It's not just a fluke if your family is dealing with it. It's not just the bad luck of the draw. This is a pretty solid percentage of our population that we have, at least in my opinion, never found a particularly good way to fit into society. A few places have, but... Um, and how do you get people to care about questions like that? So, so these days, for the last few years, I've been working on this show, Invisibilia, um, which is about the invisible forces that shape human behavior. And a lot of the time, we take on stories like this, um, stories that deal with people who have extremely violent thoughts. Everywhere they look, they picture murdering. How does a person like that get through life? Do they want to do it? Are they a danger to society? Um, Stories about young men who are drawn to ISIS, who find belonging there. Why, how do they lead to that? And how, if possible, can we welcome them back into society? Um, and so we're creating this story at National Public Radio. We get a daily um, ethical newsletter. It's, it's a place with a lot of rules and guidelines. And so, but what I'm constantly trying to think about is, you know, I'm sitting in that newsroom. I don't, I feel like a fraud. I have no journalistic training other than everything I learned on the job, which now is like 11 years. So I guess I'm all right. But I still feel like a fraud every day, like I don't belong there. And, and when I'm sitting at that computer, I find it very hard to think about the more whimsical, imaginative stuff. And so my, my first rule, I'm going to just kind of whiz through nine different, um, different ideas here. But... Um, the first thing I do to try to think about a little bit of imagination is get the hell away from your computer. Shut it down, take a walk, go sit under a tree. Sometimes I'll, I'll do, it, like, do it in the morning or late at night, like lie on my bed on my belly. It has been well documented for decades that emotions work both ways. I think we like to think that emotions come mostly from deep reasons inside, but they go the other way. If you just form your body into a different position, you can get into a different state. So I'm trying to get out of that work mode and just think, 
how would I tell this story? I've perhaps done the interviews, I've listened to the tape, and there's one way I could write it at work, but then in this other space, almost reconnecting with myself as a little girl when I used to just write fiction stories or draw pictures, how would I tell the story from that space? For just, let me just entertain it for 20 minutes, for one hour, let me not picture my editors and my colleagues, and let me just think about this story from that place. Um, and so I'll often try to do that actually right before a recorded interview to sort of prep for it. What's the most fantastical version of this piece? What could we talk about? Where could we go? How could it start? Um, and so for a story we did about um, this man who's blind but can ride a bicycle, he uses echolocation, which is basically what bats use. He clicks his tongue like and he can, from that, see all kinds of incredible things to the degree that he can actually ride a bike. Um, and so it, it, it's a big piece about him. And, and I thought, okay, well, as a listener, how could this begin? Because the one question I'm going to be having as a listener is, is this a hoax? Is this guy really blind? It, can, can he, if he can ride a bike? And so that's when I thought, okay, I think I know how we need to begin this story. I don't know if he's going to go for it, but I know what I want to ask. So it starts, we're, we're on a hike. He's leading me on a hike. As the listener, you know nothing about him. We, we've been hiking for about an hour in the woods, and then we sit down to take a break. Could we look at your eyes? In terms of them being out? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, in a somewhat surreal gesture, Daniel pulls down his lower eyelids. Let me just... And removes his eyes. Okay. They're prosthetic, of course, and they clink a little bit as he hands them over to me. That's so cool. Two of the most beautiful hazel blue eyes I've ever seen in the palm of his hand. Can I hold? Yeah. Okay. Is it okay my hand? Mm -hmm. Wow. They are so lifelike. Does it feel odd to not have them in? Yes. Oh, it does? Oh, yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> I especially like the end there. It's like, yes, you idiot. <laughs> it's weird to be walking around without eyes. Um, <clears throat> um, and, and that, okay, so again, I, I, I'm, I said this to the class yesterday, but I'm, I'm from the Northeast. We are very polite. We do not like to bother. There's a shyness um, that, and I don't know that in the moment, hiking with him, I would have ever dared to ask to hold his eyes. It's incredibly intimate, rude. Um, but I think... Sometimes that kind of pre-imagination zone where I imagine this fictional sense where like, it begins with his eyes in my hand. Um, but then it like, it sometimes forces me to just try. And then people can say no, people can say no, or people can like laugh at you like you're an idiot for wondering if that's uncomfortable. And, and again, this is sort of one of my favorite things. You, you imagine something strange, you put it out into the world, the reaction is even stranger or richer, it takes it in a different direction. It's not sad, it's just uncomfortable. So, so yeah, so anyway, I get away, I get away from the, the computer. And that brings me to the second thing, um, that image that you hopefully just saw of a man handing his eyeballs over to a, a woman, um, is somewhat surreal, somewhat like a dolly painting. And, and, and I think one of our gifts as radio makers and as storytellers of any kind is to kind of implant surrealistic, beautiful images into the minds of our readers and listeners because this world can feel kind of flat. And with our word choices, we can show these, these sort of like magical spaces. So I'm constantly thinking about how our job as a storyteller is you're, you're a filmmaker. You're trying to create images through precision of word choice, through what you show, um, what you write about. And, and, and so, you know, it's often said that the secret of radio is images. It, it's not about sound. It's about the images, the stories you tell, the scenes you put forth. Um, and I think that's the true for, for all storytelling. Um, and so the question, though, is how do you get those images? When you're interviewing, fine, you can write whatever you want, but when you're interviewing, when you're talking to people, how do you get beyond sort of the cocktail party spiel, which, again, I think is the enemy to reporting? How do you get away from just those things that people say? You ask where they grew up, and they just go on to a script, and you can hear this flatness in their tone of voice. They're not really talking. They're not really thinking. Um, so how do you get out of that? And, and I think, I'm sure many of you kind of have stumbled on this trick, but this odd thing about how emotions and stories tick, uh, stick to physical objects, 
a setting. And the more and more you ask about the, the sort of films, the visuals of their memories, the precise details, before you get to any big ideas, the more you just cast around in their memories and ask, well, what, what color was the room? Or what did that truck smell like? They're almost so weirded out. Like, we're talking about a big thing in my life. Why do you care what color the pickup truck was? Um, it almost catches them off guard, I think. And, and I almost think of it like you're, you're trying to pull the right rock that leads you down into this secret passageway. And you finally move the right one, and then you hear them enter. And, and I think what it does is it brings them, it forces them to look around in their memories and start actually remembering in a new way to get off that script. Um, and so I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of, I'm constantly doing that, maybe a little bit obsessively, but once we're, we're in a, once we're talking about a memory or part of the story that's really important, I just try to get really precise on details. Um, and so here's a just really quick clip of just a minute of raw tape. It's this woman, Ellen Baxter, who would go on to start a really revolutionary um, place for people with mental illness to live in New York City. And this, her whole kind of journey started with when she saw her mom go into an institution and it was just horrible and um, a mental institution. And so to make sure she understood, when she was in college, she faked her way onto a mental institution in the 70s and, and was there for 10 days as a patient, just kind of looking around and this woman, she's done amazing things, but she just isn't a fantastic storyteller. And so she kept rushing over this. She would just say a sentence about it. And I was like, no, we need to be in this hospital. Um, and so I asked her to just kind of describe it. And you'll hear right at the end, at least for me, her voice kind of changes. and She suddenly goes there. Um, so It had the smell of an institution. There was a stagnancy in the air and the way people treated one another was hostile mm -hmm. and just one second on that smell is it is it like linoleum or how would you put words to the smell like there was a sour mop that cleaned it every day, day after day. So that sour mop smell sinks into the linoleum and then into the wood. Yeah. It's always there. Yeah. Even if you clean once with a clean mop, it doesn't go away. And it's on people's, it seeps into people's clothes. Yeah. And it's, it's not only the ammonia, it's a particular uh, ugly smell. And is it like, to you, is it the smell of like distance? Like what is the feeling you get? What does it conjure to you? Neglect. And then she's like there. And then I literally started asking her about her experience and she suddenly remembered all these stories of the staff members not looking at her or treating her like a toy. And anyway, I just think of it as like you drop down, you hear it, and then ask the questions from, from inside there. So um, if you want to learn more about this, there's a great little 10-minute documentary called The Schwartz Technique. And it's um, this CBC producer, Tony Schwartz, he used to have people actually lie down. I've never done this, but lie down when he interviewed them. And like, anyway, he goes to a new level. It's awesome. Um, okay. We're, we're going to go without, without clips for a little. OK, so number three, deploy test subjects. How do you get more imagination, more richness into your work? One of the themes Jackie was talking about is collaboration. The best ideas I have always found come from outside my head. So when you're trying to bring more in, you, sure, you can go interview. You can think of the things you can think of. But what we'll often do, there's this, there's this program in the States called Radio Diaries, and they put out this like DIY, it's free, it's a little DIY um, workbook about how they work with subjects where they give them a tape recorder, and they'll often tape record themselves for a year, or you know maybe it's a month over a story. And we just sort of rip off this technique, and um, we have people use their smartphones. Most people now have access to a smartphone, can very easily record. Um, and so if somebody's going through something, 
like we, had, we did a story about a woman who wasn't exactly transitioning genders, but she had this strange situation where she would kind of strobe back and forth between male and female. Um, and so she kept an, an audio diary for months as this would happen. And, and you'd get it right after the fact or right as it was going on. And the intensity of emotion when something has just happened or when you're about to do something scary, it, it brings in all this stuff. And then and we've done this on story after story. Um, the, another, another one's about a guy who had been anonymous as, as an artist and writer for a long time about to come out. Come out. Um, he... Uh, spoiler alert, never does, decides not to because he's too afraid. Um, and, you know, even something really low stakes, like we did a, a little newsroom story about a, a guy who had invented a watch that, that tells you how long you've left to live at all times. <laughs> so it's just like counting down. Um, and, and his theory was like, if you wear this thing, you'll live a better life because you're always, you're always in touch with your mortality. You'll make better decisions. But then we talked to a psychologist who was like, I have actually studied this thing. It's called mortality salience in uh, psychology. And yes, you might experience a surge of carpe diem, but actually it also makes you more homophobic, racist, violent, uh, xenophobic, uh, anxious. And so, and he was like, but you don't know, there's studies. And so the guy, the scientist was like, but I don't want to say how it's going to work until we have more data. So we went out and got more data and we like gave a bunch of people this watch. They each wore it for 24 hours. And then we just, you know, like cut it into a little montage, kind of silly, but kind of one guy was really anxious. This other woman was like, I see the world in new colors, but you... <laughs> You get, you get, and then the little oddnesses, like that guy who was anxious was talking about, like, I'm sorting mail, and every fucking second is a second of my life. Now I hate junk mail. So you get the weird details that just can make a story so much more rich when you just offload the work a little bit, deploy, deploy test subjects, have them go do some interviews, do some record, records, and, and um, bring them back to you. Okay, number four, make a better date. Oh, didn't click. There we go. Make a better date, also known as um, knives bikes and trees. Um, so I'm constantly, for any interview I do, I'm thinking, how can I make this a better date? You know, like you want, you want your date to go well. Let's not just go watch a movie. All the movies are great, but like, you know, let's, let's have a little more fun. And so I'm thinking for the interview, what can someone interact with? If it's possible, where can we go? What can we do? I don't want just an airless studio version. Who are you in a studio? You are not yourself. You are a sort of manufactured version of yourself. And so, um, for instance, the knives one was for a story we did on the history of how we think about our thoughts. Um, and there's an old idea is that your thoughts mean something and that the way to health is to understand why they're there. There's a newer idea coming into popularity that your thoughts mean nothing. They're just chatter going through your head and you don't need to worry about why they're there. So for the guy who was suffering from violent thoughts, everywhere he looked, he dreamed of slashing people. He came into contact with a therapist who said, you don't need to worry about these. You're not going to hurt anyone. The only thing making you sick is how much you're worrying about them. We need to get you to stop worrying about them. And so the way I'm going to do that is have you hold a butcher knife to my neck for 10 minutes to show you that you're not going to do anything about it. It's a form of evidence. So obviously, we go out. We interview the therapist. We interview the guy. We interview his family. Um, and then we're in the studio, and, 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 or we're interviewing the thing, and, and I'm like, we we got to hold it. Can we hold the knife to your throat? Um, and so we did. I, my co-host Elise held a butcher knife to the therapist's throat and we recorded it. And just that sound, like the difference of doing it versus talking about it and seeing a butcher knife to a jugular and realizing she got nervous. She thought, what if I slip? I think it, it enlivens things. Um, <laughs> it, it, it. <laughs> You hear the little asides. You hear her, her voice shaking. It, um, and with, with the bike, that was for a story actually takes place close to here um, in a town called Hale, where for 700 years in Belgium, they have been welcoming people with severe mental illness or madness, as it was called at the time, um, into their homes and boarding them alongside each other. No asylum, just everyone took in a border. It became so normal a part of culture that a third of people in this town were mentally ill. Anyway, um, and so we went to go look at one of these families where this guy, Luke, he had had all kinds of struggles. He would be violent. He would hallucinate. He was living with this family. He'd been there for 12 years. Um, they weren't his biological family, but they had this kind of great functioning unit. And he had this incredible freedom. He had just talked about how he had spent years in an institution and how he wasn't even allowed to go out to smoke. Um, and his, and his like, host parents had bought him this electric bike that he'd been using for years. They showed me the mileage. He logged like thousands of miles. 
and he loved biking. So I said, all right, well, can I come with you? So we went on a two hour bike ride. And just the, he came alive when I'd been interviewing him in the context of his family, he was a little bit quieter. But when he was leading me, and even just hearing him have the keys to the gate, that alone showed so much compared to life in an asylum. And like how his voice, he's all confidently telling me which way to go and where we went to his ice cream place and this reflecting pool. And it just, you see this other side. Um, I'll skip trees, but just for time, but uh, we, I climbed a tree with a guy. Um, so constantly thinking, and it can be small. It can be small. It doesn't have to be some epic thing. Um, there was a, a guy who, who reluctantly just seemed to have discovered immortality in a sea creature called Hydra, microscopic creature. He set out to prove they weren't immortal, but then um, they still have not died. And by generations, they're hundreds of thousands of generations old. So I just had him bring in one of these Hydra in a little, into the studio, just play with it and look at it. And, and hearing him say, yeah, I've been carrying this with me for 40 years. Anyway, it's just these little things. So, okay, gamification. I am constantly, often interviewing scientists, bless their hearts. Um, <laughs> they, can, they, can, they can be dry, and I understand why. They are wary of us. I respect why they are wary of journalists because we butcher their work all the time. Um, but there can be a stiffness. So I'm constantly, every, try to think of every single interview, what can be a tiny game? What little thing can I bring in my pocket? What little idea, um, what, you know, like if we're talking uh, about choice, the paradox of we believe that having more choices is, the, the, is, the, is freedom. And having no choices is confinement. But, but then there's this weird paradox of choice where if we have too many choices, we're confined in a new way. And so for that interview, um, we took this scientist to uh, the, a, a supermarket in the States with like 50 different kinds of apples. Um, and all these different varieties and colors and names. And, and we had him try to pick the best apple and like how ang anxious it got. And then we had one of us pick another apple and then we had a taste off, even just like the, ooh, whose apple's gonna taste better? The lowest stakes thing. But again, it proves the point. Um, okay, number six, um, let conversation drive narration or narrative if, if you are writing. Um, so this was one of the biggest innovations of Radiolab, um, which was the first show I worked at. That's Jad and Robert, they are the co-hosts. And they, they started up in about 2004, and what they did to radio was a huge change. At that point, most, most radio was either an interview show or it was a written piece with tape, written piece, tape. They sat down and chatted with each other authentically about stories they'd each reported. And then they cut that conversation, real unscripted conversation, where one of them didn't know anything about the other thing, in, into narration. And then they would start using the tape to poke through their actual conversation. And what that did to narrative is it totally scrambled it. What you think is interesting becomes totally boring because the person isn't interested. They ask you about things you had no intent to write about in the honor of sort of one of the C's of Jackie's, follow your curiosity. I think what conversation does is forces us into sometimes a more authentic story um, because, because someone else is in the room being bored in real time, <laughs> being interested in real time, stumping us in real time, asking us questions we forgot to go find the answers about. And what that did for structure was made these wild, just like inverted, curly Q, figure eight-like structures, because conversation, if you notice it, never, never goes from A to B. You, you, you flash forward, you move back. Um, and so when I moved into the newsroom um, at, at NPR a few years later, after I'd come back from my leaving journalism, um, and then I started to wonder, well, how can I do this? Because for about a year, I was just you know, all alone writing stories by myself, and I'd never really done it that way. So sometimes what I would do is call my mom um, and just record myself telling it to her, record my side and kind of get into that zone that was away from writing. Um, and then another thing I did is, is kind of related from get away from your computer is just when I'd be right inside all that, all the story, the tape was in my head, I'd be hyper vigilant to noticing when an idea for a structure struck me. And often this would come to me when I was walking or on runs. I'm sure many of you have, have experienced that. And I would notice this like synthesization, synthesization, I'm jet lagged, um, the, of, of, of topics of what tape to use, of where to start, what to cut. It was crystal clear. 
in this way that when, at least for me, when I'm sitting at the computer, my problem is I think everything is great. And, and so this natural cutting just came. And so I've started, and I, this is my saving grace. Um, I just write stories on my voice memo. And I just, it comes, I'm on a run, and there it is, and I know, I know the tape so well that I just kind of play the tape, and then I play myself. I will play you 30 seconds of this horrible technique. When John was little, he used to love the feel of the world on his skin. But that would soon change. First, he became afraid of his reflection. I used to avoid washing my hands. He'd look away, it just looked ghastly. Okay, and that goes on for 12 minutes. But it's the entire story. It was this story I was wondering about. It's about, it's a really odd story. It's about a guy with schizophrenia, how he was, the more he went off his meds, the more he was drawn to wearing layers. The more layers appealed to him. Layers, which have this weird place in culture as being a sort of parodied thing in Hollywood. Oh, the crazy person is wearing tattered layers. There's a scientist who looked into it, Notice this phenomenon across cultures, across climate zones. People in hot, hot India were wearing layers. People hypothesized, oh, it's a stereotype. Oh, it's just because you're homeless and you need to carry your stuff on your back. He looked into it and he found that the more that people were unmedicated, there were issues in their, in their thermoregulation systems and that maybe they were wearing, for some of these people, they were wearing layers because they were actually freaking cold. Um, and so this is the story about a, a guy who kind of went through that and it, it takes some weird turns and then also the science about it. But I'm like, how do I start? Like, how do I start this? And it just descended that line, you know, the world used to feel nice. And, and then I just, anyway, so, and then I'll go and type it up and those things, they do more for me than, than hours and hours and hours in the office. And so I catch them. I am hyper vigilant. I catch them when they come. Um, okay. And then number seven. Um, so creative constraints. I am constantly thinking about what, what, what could be the creative constraint for this piece? Um, what could be the fun little thing in form that just, that makes this piece a little bit more fun, a little different. So um, I recently did a story about a guy who had been trying to break the four minute mile, running a mile in four minutes. Um, only about 200 people in the States have ever done it. He had been trying to break this his whole life. He was a young guy, high school, trying. he kept getting close. He kept getting to like 409. He was almost there, but he couldn't do it. He gets in a horrific accident. He's hit, he's on a motorcycle, he's hit by a car, he has brain damage. He wakes up, he's a slightly different person. He gets back on the track and he can break it. <laughs> he can break it. Um, and so it's about this weird role of self in athleticism and how with a changed self, he suddenly became someone who could break it. And so I thought, huh, well, if he can run a freaking mile in four minutes, I wonder if I can tell his story in four minutes. Um, and so, which for me is, I know for some radio news people, that's like every day, but most of my stories are like 50 minutes. So that was a challenge, um, but, but it worked and we had the host like shoot off a gun and, um, and it, it was neat. Um, and then, you know, I, I think like we, there's, I don't know, I'm, I'm just constantly thinking about what's the constraint for this. In the, in the piece about that watch that people wear and the guy describing the other potential side effects of thinking about your mortality, like homophobia, racism, xenophobia, anxiety. Um, the piece ends with the two people having their experience, the, the radio diaries of the woman who had a great time and the guy who got anxious. And then it ends with the scientist saying, so, so yeah, you know, the or, or I say the watch comes out in two months and, and feel free to, to try it yourself. And then the scientist says, but remember, side effects may include. And then he just lists off everything he's ever noticed over 30 years of studying this. And then we speed it up. So it's like one of those pill commercials, racism, homophobia, um, just like, and so I'm trying to think of what, can, how can the constraint, and what we're saying, I think another guiding principle that I have, or we have is whiplash. What we're saying is really dark things. It's, it's saying that thinking about our mortality has been shown to make us more racist, more xenophobic. It's not nice stuff. But then using play and whimsy to kind of like serve these lessons, constantly jumping back and forth, dropping humor into a really sad story, dropping hope into a hopeless story, 
wrapping some really dark thing in a sparkly package. That is what I love to do. Um, so yeah, you know, I, there a story about people discovering, um, studying freestyle, hip hop freestylers in, in Baltimore, threw them in a, an fMRI and found that you're better at freestyling when your mind, your prefrontal cortex is basically turned off. <laughs> so like when you're not overthinking, all this poetry, all these associations come forward. So how are we gonna tell that story? I think we're gonna need to try to freestyle. Um, so just things like that. Okay, number eight. Um, okay, creative constraints. Or sorry, wow, still there. Okay, um, yes, reframe the conflict as the spark. Okay, second to last one. So finish up in the newsroom. Start, um, I start working with Elise Spiegel, who is this goddess of a reporter. Um, she helped start This American Life. She was a mental health reporter for 10 years on National Public Radio. Anytime you'd be drinking your coffee and suddenly notice you are so pulled into a four minute story, it feels like a, a novel. That was probably one of her stories. She, she is a goddess of reporting, of storytelling. We get together to start working on this show. And I had come from Radiolab, where every other thing you said, Jad and Robert were like, wow, ooh, it was like a wonder festival. And Elise is not so easily wowed. It is so hard to get this woman to say wow. And I was hurting in my soul. I was like trying to tap dance. I could not delight her. And it was killing me. It was killing, it was killing my process. And um, there'd be times I'd bring stories and I couldn't get the, the dazzle in the eye. And I was like, I don't know if we are made to work together. Like, I don't know if I make sense to her. And we were working on this story about, um, about the blind man who can ride a bike. And I'd put together this huge long draft and at one point toward the end, there's a bit of science where people, neurologists looked at his brain and after a lifetime of echolocating, they discovered that his visual cortex was lighting up almost exactly like a sighted person. Um, if, if a bowl moved from left to right while he was echolocating, his visual cortex was lighting up in the same way that a person who watched a bowl moving left to right would light up. In some very real way, it was like he was seeing. So I make this neurology section, we tell his story, then there's this aha science, then there's like a sad little ender. And, 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 I, and I was trying to be really clever and I was like, yeah. And so the thing about visual processing is to construct images, we'll, we'll, we often like it through the eye holes, but we'll take it through the ear holes. And that's how I wrote it. And anyway, so then we listen to the draft and, and I'm trying to be clever. And, and Elise says, okay, you know, great things here, but I think we should cut the neurology section. And I was like, cut the neurology section? Are you mad? Like this, it's saying that a blind person might, you might not need eyes to see. And she's like, it's saying that? You didn't say that. And, and I was like, well, but I said the th clever, she's like, I didn't get what, but she's like, you didn't say that. If it's saying that, that's cool. And so in that moment, I realized, okay, I've got to completely redo this section. And I grabbed her. I literally just had a microphone and grabbed her right there without telling her what we were doing. And, um, and then this is how we ended up doing the neurology section. All right, Miss Spiegel. So I know that sometimes neurology and neuroscience goes over my head. Or just sounds like a foreign language that you're not particularly interested in <laughs> speaking. Uh huh. But just lay on the plane for me. Okay. What does this mean? What this work suggests uh -huh. is that you may not actually need eyes to see. I kind of feel like we got to shout it from the rooftops. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. You might not need eyes to see! And Laura is by no means the only person seeing this result. The idea first started coming up in the mid-90s, when a lab at Harvard saw that visual areas of the brain can be activated by sound and touch. Do I have to do it? Uh-huh. You might not need eyes to see! Okay, so what I learned then is like, oh crap, this is our dynamic. I am trying to delight her and she is not wowed. Um, but this is it, this is our spark. Reframe the conflict as the spark. I think without her reluctance, I would be unpalatable. Like that's what I have, that's what I have deduced. Like if it was too much wonder, it's just wonder on wonder. And her annoyance is what makes it work. Um, and so kind of 
finding your conflict, whether it's with an editor, with whoever it is, and stop wishing for a different place. Play with it. Realize that this is giving you your juice. This is what is making you different. Um, and so that kind of became, that is one of the tones of Invisibilia. Um, and then we took on our third co-host, Hannah Rosen, who is just an amazing writer. And, and it added kind of a new dynamic. And you just like play with what, what you've got. Um, and so the last thing is, don't be afraid of the dark. All this whimsy, all this play, this singing, this rhyming, I think is in a way in service of some of the darker stuff. Um, I'll just play a, a very short clip of, you know, on the show we, we talk a lot, we talk about fear, suicide, disability. Um, here's just a clip from our trailer from the last season. As humans, we are really good at getting into messes with one another. I just saw this arm with a long barrel gun come between us. I thought, they call me terrorist, so I would give them a terrorist. Wow. Misunderstanding one another. I thought they were my friends. I didn't know they weren't my friends. His intentions are the best in the world, but it makes this atmosphere tense. Getting angry with one another. Why do you have to look cool? Why do you have to come off as smart? Why do you have to keep it all together? Frustrated. I can't help it. I can't help it. Let down. You want me to be someone I'm not. And in the early days of the show, we got the note that maybe it was a little too dark. Girls, is this a little too dark? Are you addicted to the dark? Is it too dark? Is it too dark? Are people going to want to listen to this? And... You know, our first season, we lucked out on timing, but the numbers showed us that people wanted to listen. Um, and we had about 50 million downloads our first season. So about 10 million downloads a show. And time and time again, our inboxes were flooded with, thank you for doing something about this. The violent thoughts, I thought I was alone. I thought it meant I was sick. Entertaining the idea that I don't have to be afraid of them has literally changed my life. Um, and. The email that for me most did it was about one of our reports on mental health. And this mom wrote in and just said, my son, 22, died by suicide three years ago. About a year later, I wrote a bitter email to NPR expressing how abandoned I felt, trying to adjust to my new normal with the lack of any NPR reporting on suicide and mental health. It means so much to so many of us to have enterprise reporting on the issues of mental health. We need to think about this stuff. We all struggle with it. It's, it's a lie. It's a ruse to pretend we don't. And I think when you look at it directly, when you take it on, when you talk about it without an air of stigma, when you just talk about it with each other, it can do so much because of this odd property of emotion once described by Camus, that crushing truths perish when acknowledged. Thanks. Thanks.